Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Matters That Matter, a conversation series from Hendricks Chapel. My name is Brian Conkle. I serve as Dean of Hendricks Chapel and Professor of Practice in the Department of Religion here at Syracuse University. This is our sixth installment of Matters That Matter. This is an online conversation series where we seek to amplify intentional conversation about religion, spirituality, values, belief, and motivation. We invite our guests to share about choices made, difficulties encountered, and commitments solidified. Uh, this evening, we are honored to welcome our guest, the Reverend Cornell William Brooks of Harvard University. Reverend Brooks, welcome, and thank you for being with us. Thank you. It's great to be here with you. Just a brief introduction. Reverend Brooks serves as the Hauser Professor of the Practice of Nonprofit Organizations and Professor of Practice of Public Leadership and Social Justice at the Harvard Kennedy School. He is also director of the William Monroe Trotter Collaborative for Social Justice at the School Center for Public Leadership and visiting professor of practice of prophetic religion and public leadership at Harvard Divinity School. Reverend Brooks is former president and CEO of the NAACP, a civil rights attorney, and an ordained minister. Once again, thank you, Reverend Brooks, for being here. Uh, what I've learned is that your great-great-grandfather, your great-grandfather, and your grandfather were all ministers, but I've heard you describe your own path to ordained ministry as a winding one. Could you share a little bit about your call to ministry? Sure, sure. Um, well, I share this story certainly with the hope that if there are any students listening who are undecided about what they want to be when they grow up, um, I, I'm a textbook example that uh, one can in fact grow up and make some decent career choices. I grew up in a, in a household where my grandfather, great-grandfather, and great-great-grandfather were all ministers in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And because I was surrounded by Methodist ministers on my mother's side of the family and on my father's side of the family, Baptist ministers. So uh, being uh, like any self-respecting young person, being ministers is exactly what I did not want to be. So in fact, I went to uh, college declaring to all my friends that the church was an anachronistic institution represented by ministers who were the most anachronistic within an anachronistic institution, uh, and that we should get rid of sermons, get rid of churches, and be about the revolution, uh, as, as I defined it as an 18-year-old. Well, in the span of, of uh, three years, um, I was called into the ministry, proving only that, that God has a sense of humor. The way that happened uh, very briefly is I heard a speaker who asked three questions to a group of about several hundred uh, college students. And he asked these questions. The first question he asked was, how many of you believe in God? This being Mississippi, the Bible Belt, everyone raised their hand. Then he asked, how many of you read the Bible from cover to cover? No one raised their hand. Second question he asked, how many of you believe that America is a great country? Uh, back in that time, everyone raised their hands in the affirmative. Uh, and then he asked, how many of you read the Constitution in its entirety? No one. Last question, how many of you believe that Dr. King, as in Dr. Martin Luther King, was a great man? Being an, an HBCU, uh, uh, we being the, the grandchildren of the Civil Rights Movement, everyone raised their hand. Then he asked the closing question, how many of you have read all of his books? And in a room, auditorium full of hundreds of students, no one. So I left the room profoundly embarrassed and also deeply determined to read the Constitution in its entirety, read the Bible in its entirety, and read at least the books of Dr. King in their entirety. In so doing, that awakened within me a calling to serve God as an ordained minister in the very church that I mocked, in the very vocation that I mocked, and to serve as a social justice minister by being a civil rights lawyer. So I resolved to go to seminary and to go to law school and to pursue ordination in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So every time I preach, uh, it is uh, an indictment of my youthful arrogance. <laughs> well, Real talk. 
<laughs> and now, and now, in terms of your work as an educator, I would love to share. There's a class that you teach right now called "Creating Justice in Real Time: sure. Vision, Strategies, and Campaign." I'd love to hear a little more about that calling of yours and the way in which you see religious and spiritual life as creating justice in real time. What does that look like for your students? And what might that look like, quite frankly, for us here at Syracuse University? Sure. So one of the things that uh, resonates with me, with me so, so deeply uh, is the predicament and the plight of students in the midst of generationally unprecedented activism around the world and across the country, which is to say, how do students respond to the social injustices of their time? So when I came to the Kennedy School, had to get arrested with 18 and 19 year olds uh, in Chicago, uh, in Alabama, having protested, marched literally hundreds of miles with young people. I came to the Harvard Kennedy School with the determination to create a class that would, that would give young activists the tools, the skills, the strategies to turn activism into action, outrage into outcomes, protests into policy. So the class is really designed to allow students to work with nonprofit organizations around the country on grassroots social justice concerns where they literally develop advocacy campaigns, draft legislation, draft um, regulations, draft policy outcomes. So in other words, if you're working the, with an organization to address police misconduct, you not only draft, you not only create the plan for the protests, the social media campaign, the marches, but also what does a, a disinvest uh, in bad policing, uh, policy look like and investing in good policing or good uh, uh, public safety look like. So in other words, we literally try to equip students to help activists, but also give their activism impact. Hmm. So there's a focus on policy expertise. But Brian, let me, let me be clear about this. Also moral expertise. Why? Because go to any protest in the country and in any, any situation of conflict or tension, who are the trusted leaders? Quite often, people in the faith community. We convene in our houses of faith, our synagogues, our mosques, our temples, our churches. People may be distrustful of some of the some houses of faith, even some leaders of faith. But in the main, they are our moral brokers, our moral emissaries, our moral ambassadors. So that's why I try to teach in, in this class. Legislative analysis, policy analysis, moral analysis, and the ability to what? Get something done. I'm really fascinated by what you're talking about here. And I love your bridge here between faith and action. The idea mm -hmm. that our theological affirmations right. have social and political implications. Wow. And, that, that, and that what we're saying here, but what I'm fascinated about is You've referenced Dr. King. You've recognized mm -hmm. the era in which you were formed and transformed mm -hmm. and informed. Right. And I'm wondering about this current dynamic from the sense of faith, religion, and spirituality. We know right now on your campus, on our campus, religious identity is changing right. like never before. We have the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, those students coming to campus that do not affiliate with any religious tradition at all. We have students that have hyphenated identities that might identify with a multiplicity of religious traditions. So with religious and spiritual demographics changing in ways like never before, how is it that you see the role of religion and spirituality still having that center? Because it seems like those two would be contrary to one another, but it sounds like you're saying that it's still very much tethered together. Very much so. Let's, let's be clear. That students who are arriving on campus in many instances, without being religiously affiliated, as in non-affiliated. Non-affiliated does not mean non-morally committed. It does not mean non-religiously uh, curious, non-religiously interested, 
non-morally interested. And so the very students who are outraged by the injustice of people being treated differently based on race, ethnicity, um, uh, gender, uh, uh, gender identity, are outraged because of their moral sensibilities. And it is quite often that houses of faith are places where people can have not just conversations about what they believe, but also what they doubt. <laughs> so in other words, when you come to religious spaces and say, you know, I, I, I doubt the permanence of racism. I doubt um, the permanence of militarism. I believe that we can end racism. I believe we can end militarism. I believe we can end injustice. So my point being here is, yes, there, there are a large number of nuns, as it were, but there are a greater number of people who want to believe in something. As I say to all my agnostic and atheist friends, they tell me all the time, we love the way God's people organize, we just have a problem with their God. So why, we, why are we having a question about the God? Why are we having a conversation about the God question? Can't we deal with the God concerns? Can't we deal with the moral concerns, the value concerns? Because here's what we know. In the, the, the lingua franca of public discourse is not profit maximization. It's values, right? It's right and wrong. We, we, you don't hear anyone saying George Floyd died a tragic death because uh, uh, public safety was ineffective in Minneapolis. They say he died a tragic death as he was murdered because it was wrong. That kind of policing was wrong. It's unjust. It's unfair. It's unconscionable. It's immoral. Uh, and some folk who may not religiously affiliate say it's ungodly. Mm. And so my, my point being is, I, we, we don't need to get distracted about who's Baptist, who's Methodist, who's, who's Reformed um, uh, Orthodox, uh, Reconstructionist, or Episcopalian or Lutheran. What we need to be focused on is who's concerned about that spark of the divine in their fellow students, in their fellow person. Mm. I, I, I think makes for interesting social justice activism. Mm. I'm th thinking about activism here, and you alluded to it a moment ago, around, shall we say, that movement mm -hmm. where you see something and you know in your heart and your mind that that which you are seeing is disconnected from the way we should be being, right? That That's disconnect right. from where you know what is is disconnected from what ought. And right. could you share a little bit more about, specifically, you know, as I'm thinking about our students here at Syracuse, mm -hmm. where okay, I've seen something, I've experienced something, and I know that that's not right. But now there's, there's that shift, there's that movement from anger to action, as, as I believe you just said a moment ago. Could you share a little bit of the strategies that you're teaching? I think in your, in your words, uh, I read something about, we need leaders, and this is a quote, I believe that's from yourself, we need leaders who are multilingual in terms of policy and discipline multilingual in terms of culture, and we can't raise up leaders who are risk averse. True. Could you share True. a little bit more, please? Sure, so our, today's activists who have been literally called by circumstance, by history, I believe by God, to deal with massive long-standing injustices at an unprecedented scale, right? So the the George Floyd protests are the largest in American history, roughly at a minimum 15 million people across all 50 states engaging in some kind of protests, okay? So this is massive scale. But the challenge for us is how do we go from tweeting to legislation or policy? So that assumes a certain kind of, of um, fluency of communication with respect to social media but also a fluency with respect to policy. What I mean by that is talking to, to activists about, uh, yes, Black Lives Matter, but what does Black Lives Matter mean in terms of qualified immunity for police officers who kill people? What does um, uh, our outrage mean in terms of children being caged on the border 
uh, in terms of fluency, in terms of how do we police our borders, how do we secure our borders, how do we treat migrants and immigrants fairly, humanely, lawfully, and constitutionally. So the point being here is we have to give students the tools in terms of public policy. And also, note this, the confidence. Because so often we, 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 we want to outsource this notion that only senators, only representatives, only mayors and governors can talk about public policy. But we have to ask ourselves this question. The only difference between the governor and you is an election. You can learn what a governor knows. You can learn what a senator knows. You don't have to, you don't have, to have a PhD in public policy to be able to put forward thoughtful uh, policy recommendations, particularly as a student. Students are writing papers every day. And last point here, I, I think this is critically important, is to go back to this point of, 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 uh, of morality uh, and the relationship between morality and activism. Think about this. Black Lives Matter has, uh, has, has been understood to be a, an activist cry, right? But Black Lives Matter is, if you ask me, a post-millennial 2020 version of the Imago Dei. The Imago Dei, the notion that people are created in the image of God and as such have innate worth and value. That's a animating philosophy of the Declaration of Independence. It is the gift of Judaism to the world. And it is represented in the notion that Black Lives Matter, because to say that Black Lives Matter means to say that Black people have self-worth, they have value, they have dignity. And as such, that means other people also have dignity and worth. So my point being is activists engaged in theological talk, theological uh, a value proposition, a value discussion, even when we don't call it religious talk. Uh, I want to make a programming note. For those of us tuning in here on Facebook Live, please feel free to throw in a question or a comment on our comments feed. Uh, those of us working here on the inside here on Hendricks Chapel on this platform will share some of those comments with myself and we'll try to ask those questions to Reverend Brooks here. So again, those tuning in, if you have a question, if you have a comment, please feel free to type it on in. That will get to us here on this platform and I'll do my best to vet through those and to share those with Reverend Brooks. Um, I love what you said about the Imago Day, And I think that that goes back to what I mentioned earlier about that there are social and political implications to our theological affirmations. And the Imago right. Day is one of them. And what I love theologically is how the Imago Day is connected to the Missio Day, the mission of God, and the ways in which God is inviting us into what God is doing. And I think about it in a couple different ways. Some of them we were touching upon here is the act of reconciliation, also the act of transformation, and also the act of empowerment. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. about this moment that we find ourselves, you're at a higher education institution, I'm at a higher education institution, post COVID-19, as we're thinking mm -hmm. five, 10, 20 years down the line, this time of activism, I'm curious about your thoughts about the role of higher education as participants in God's mission, higher education as instruments of reconciliation, transformation, and empowerment. I'm wondering if you could give us some comments about this time for higher ed. I believe deeply with all my heart that the college campus, the university campus, even as we define it globally and digitally as in online, represents the front, uh, the, the, the uh, forefront, the vanguard of social justice. So in other words, as we're dealing with the pandemic, who are the people who are wrestling with the, uh, the disruption of their education? the disruption of their social lives, the disruption of the early formation of who they are, but university students. So in this moment, we are literally uh, on the forefront of this pandemic in terms of how to grapple with, how to educate, how to bring people together, how to, how to uh, create and maintain community. So the point being here is we should also be on the forefront of innovation, the forefront of serving one another, the forefront of, 
of building, maintaining, and strengthening community in this moment of, and be on the forefront of maintaining a sense of mission, right? So in other words, when we saw policy that imperiled international students who are seeking education, it was higher education, uh, you know, my, my, my institution being one of them, going to court on behalf of international students, saying international students need a place to study. Right? So the, the point being is higher education is key. It is key because right now, if we look at the pressing problems, uh, the, the pandemic of police misconduct, the pandemic of COVID-19, which has exposed um, racial divisions, ethnic divisions, generational divisions, regional divisions, partisan divisions in our country. When we think about all the divides in the country, what is the one place charged with the responsibility of bringing people together in the context of learning about one another and understanding and, and exploring democratic pr principles and values. That's the college and university campus. Last point here. Every place I've gone in this country in moments of social justice conflict, the place that has been the convening ground, the trusted ground, has been, have been houses of faith. Governors, as in Governor, the Governor, uh, Governor uh, uh, Nixon uh, in Missouri after Ferguson, uh, the mayor of St. Louis, uh, the mayor of Ferguson, everybody was looking at houses of faith as convening grounds. My point being is on the campus of Syracuse University, Hendricks Chapel has got to be a convening ground. It's got to be the Mecca, the capital, the Jerusalem, if you will, the crossroads, if you will, for conversation as a consequence of who you serve, who you're charged to serve, and the fact that you owe your, your allegiance to no one. You can vote Democrat, you can vote Republican, you can be liberal, you can be uh, conservative, Baptist, or Methodist. The university campus is charged with the responsibility of serving everyone, and the chapel it's got to be at the center of that. So this is our, right? We got to be very clear about this. Higher education cannot shrink. It cannot retreat. Uh, we cannot close our doors um, because this is, this is the moment in which history and circumstance are literally pressing on the doors of the college campus. I know that in part of your role, Reverend Brooks, you track movements, student movements, right. national movements, global movements. And of course, you're aware of student activism and the tremendous efforts that's been taking place at Syracuse University. And mm -hmm. I'm curious, oftentimes people uh, outside of the campus can see the campus better than sometimes those of us on the campus. And I'm curious about your observations, um, some words of wisdom, words of caution, uh, words of hope, words of insight that you might be able to make to us at Syracuse based upon um, what you've been witnessing. Sure. So let, let me just say, um, you know, from the heart, uh, because I was a student activist, spent the bulk of my career with student activists, and now teach on a university campus. But I'm also the father of two college-age sons. And I can tell you one time, I, I remember calling my son from Ferguson in the midst of all that was going on, and him saying to me he didn't have time to talk to his dad. I asked him why. He said, because we have just taken over the, the office of the president of Amherst College. Here's my point. We're all wrapped up in this narrative of social justice. And so for the students who uh, took over um, a building at Syracuse, uh, who were concerned about the instances of, of racial animus on campus, for the students who have protested, demonstrated, who've been involved in conflict, I would simply say to you that you have a right to articulate and to press your case. But you also have a moral obligation to be not only clear, but also effective. And so what that means is your professors, your administrators owe you every support, every guidance, every encouragement, every lesson to help you make your case. But you also owe your community um, the responsibility of learning, engaging, studying how to be effective. You know, uh, you know, as a as a freshman, one of my one of my colleagues reminded me that I had a I had a friend who uh, had cerebral palsy. Uh, he uh, 
got around on campus on crutches. Uh, he's a hip hop uh, artist and poet, uh, Charlie Braxton. Long story made short, he, um, my campus didn't have ramps. Hmm. So we uh, carried him around campus. Uh, and, and then we went to the administration. And my first act as an activist was to get ramps for my friend. So we threatened the administration to go to court and to hold a press conference. Now we were freshmen at the time. I'm not entirely sure we were well sufficiently well versed in the law, but we were we we were successful. So to all the activists of Syracuse, what I say to you, this is a moment to use your leadership skills, but it also means negotiation. It also means compromise. It also means talking to administrators who may not be where they should be, or may not be uh, uh, where you think they should be. But you always had that responsibility to talk, to engage, to negotiate and compromise, because that's what makes effective uh, advocacy. Uh, starting to get some questions from our viewers here on Facebook. I'm going to go to this question coming into us from Sue, and I'm going to read it here off uh, my board. Sure. It says, Black Lives Matter is perceived by some as being anti-police and violent. Mm -hmm. How does a congregation, I'm assuming a faith community, mm -hmm. a congregation, support Black Lives Matter while still welcoming police officers within the congregation? And again, that's a question from Sue. Thank you, Sue. Sure, sure. Now, and I, I, would, I would say to Sue, um, the same diversity that you see within our houses of faith, you see in our movements. So particularly in the movement for Black Lives where uh, unlike say, the Sierra Club, the ACLU, the NAACP, it doesn't have like the hard membership um, roster that many organizations have. It's diffuse, it's democratically organized, it's widespread. And so this notion that uh, Black Lives Matter is uh, anti-police, no, they're anti-violent policing, anti-anti-Black policing, uh, anti-policing that results in brutality. That's true across the board. And so I would simply say that you can support police who are dedicated to policing that ensures public safety, meaning public safety in terms of from crime, but also public safety from police acting as criminals. Mm -hmm. Nobody supports that. In fact, if I can say to Sue this, at the NAACP, I was on the back end of death threats on a regular basis time being critical of bad policing. But the person who was charged with my, with taking care of my life was a Balt retired Baltimore police uh, homicide detective. I spent the bulk of my time with him. Not only that, with every march and every demonstration across the country, we depended on local police departments. So my point being is, I would say to you as a person of faith, you can engage the police even as you stand against bad police. We do that all the time. Uh, as old folks, uh, older folks say, my grandmother would say, you hate the sin, love the sinner. Mm -hmm. I've got another question here from Rich, who's asking, can you expand a bit more on the value of impact on allyship, mm -hmm. about being allies, and how perhaps it differs from today to compared to the civil rights era of 1960s? A little bit about allyship. But again, this comes in uh, from Rich. Sure. I mean, with the breadth and divert, as I say, the breadth of diversity in our movements, right? So the majority of people in George Floyd, in the George Floyd protests, uh, Black Lives Matter protests, are not black, right? So there's a breadth and diversity of ethnicity and race, color, caste, region, race. But there's also a diversity of interests, and so allyship in 2020 is more complicated. Uh, it's not the black and white of the 1960s, it's black, white, queer, Latino, uh, uh, differently abled, um, lots of different identities. And so the point being here is, if I can speak uh, as a person of faith, I believe allyship is critical. We need to show up, not just with the tweet, but with our, uh, our presence. Mm -hmm. I go beyond that. Mm -hmm. Allyship can sometimes devolve into shared political interest, when we really need to be talking about uh, uh, being allied, if you will, morally speaking, 
on, in a deep way. So meaning I may not have anything in common with you. I may not suffer any of the risk of, of discrimination that you face, but I'm allied with you morally, hmm. committed to you as, as, uh, as a person who feels like we share a, a, a common moral destiny, not a common political destiny. Like we may arrive at the ballot box voting differently, but in terms of our shared moral destiny, that is common. And, and so I, I think allyship is key here. Uh, last point is so often um, there's this notion that, uh, you know, allies, like say back in the 60s, uh, you know, it, it might be a matter of allies standing side by side. Sometimes allies need to stand behind. I'm standing with my sisters who are dealing with misogyny. I don't need to stand out front all the time as a heterosexual male. Maybe I need to step back. Maybe I need to uh, be in a position of support rather than being in a, in a position of prominence, uh, which does not uh, mean the same thing in terms of allyship. Being a prominent ally and being an effective ally are not necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about this time of crisis that we find mm. ourselves in and around I've, I've heard some talk about the consequences of crisis around crisis breeds clarity that sometimes crisis is a call to action sometimes crisis spurs creativity sometimes mm. crisis brings coalitions and i'm wondering mm. specifically around the matter of clarity i'm wondering mm. as we think about this moment that we're in i'm wondering what for you reverend brooks what what seems to be more clear to you as a result of this recent time of crisis that we find ourselves in? What, in your own reflections, your own activism, your prayer life, what seems to be coming into clarity as a direct consequence of the current crises that we find ourselves in? I would say two things. The, the price and the pricelessness of human life. Mm -hmm. Meaning, when we as a nation, as a congregation of the morally minded, watched the George Floyd video, which had three distinctive features. It was pornographically violent. It took place in emotional slow motion, and it had a moral intimacy. That much was clear, right? In other words, watching that video, it was clear that human life is precious. And that's what comes through across all the moments, movements. So whether it be uh, the, the March for Our Lives movements, our children are precious in the classroom. And our people are precious on the street in terms of gun violence, in terms of police misconduct, black, brown, trans, LGBTQ migrant lives are precious at the hands of the police. When we look at the, the anti-Semitism, right, think about this. We had people w walking into synagogues and firing guns and killing Jews. Precious, Jews are precious. Baptists are precious. Christians are precious. So that the preciousness of life is key because it's an organizing principle. Meaning, if you don't understand that life is precious, you don't know how to treat your fellow protesters, you don't know how to treat your, treat your fellow activists, and you don't have any vision for the future. Secondly, I think it's clear that our values have to be clear, right? So in other words, it's not about how you vote in, in November only. It's got to be about what you deem to be right and wrong and being very clear about that and not compromising on the end, even as you want to tweak, and perhaps sometimes compromise on the means or the steps to, to get there. So those two things are very clear in this moment. Last point here is that Crises may precipitate moral clarity, but to get policy clarity, you need more than a crisis. You need study, right? And I say that to uh, aspiring politicians and, and, and policymakers, but I also say that to aspiring uh, moral leaders, meaning you need to study and spend time on your knees or with your holy book, even as you spend time in the classroom, online, uh, and with the textbook. This is a serious moment. Activists have to be students of history, students of sociology, students of policy, students of law, but also students of values. Uh, we can't depend on a Christ tag, Christ, uh, a, a crisis 
a hashtag and a tweet for moral clarity and policy clarity. The first may give you some clarity, but we need study. And that's why I think university students are key here because we cannot rely on people who learn the principal lessons of their lives 40 years ago, mm -hmm. right? We all have to be students now. You may have gotten your PhD 30 years ago, but right now you have to be a student of what's happening in this moment, which means we professors have to engage their students, right? It's not just us teaching them, it's teaching us, right? Because frankly, we're dealing with policy challenges that were not manifesting the way they manifested now 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. Hmm. I'm, I'm wondering about, um, to take, it, to take a, a, the, our conversation a slight different, related, but a little slight different. You talked sure. before about different pandemics that we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. One of which that we're finding, not just at Syracuse University, but of course around the country, mental health. Uh, when we're thinking about what it is, students in isolation, students whose reality is disconnected from their dreams and aspirations, students who wanted to walk on commencement day and all of a sudden are having virtual experiences, students who are hoping to go into a particular job market that looks very differently than it did 12 right. months ago. So I'm wondering about your own journey, as you just mentioned to go from the NAACP to a Harvard educator, you've said that hope is a moral choice. That's a direct quote that I've heard from you, that hope mm -hmm. is a moral choice. Could you share a little bit about to our students, to our Syracuse University community, to the city of Syracuse residents and to the Syracuse University alumni tuning in about resiliency and perhaps where do you receive hope when there is so much evidence seemingly to the contrary. Sure, sure. So I, I, I teach at a, at a university um, that may have started with the Divinity School, but you know, Harvard is a profoundly secular place. Um, but one of the things I, I, I've come to appreciate is my students are open to what I teach on a regular basis, which is hope is not empirically demonstrated, it's morally chosen, right? In other words, you cannot make the empirical case for hope uh, only. So if we were to scan the circumstances of the moment, uh, a raging COVID-19 pan COVID pandemic, 4 million um, cases, um, a mounting death toll, uh, students and faculty and staff lives massively disrupted, dreams and aspirations upended. But here's what I would know. In every chapter of history, there have been people who literally decided in the face of all circumstances, in the face of a history that was all but discouraging, to they chose to hope, right? So you, tell me, in 1965, when John Lewis, when Amelia Boynton, on an Edmund Pettus Bridge and being beaten to the pavement like cattle, to choose to believe that they could turn around this republic was an act of hope. It was volitional. It was a decision. It was not a matter of ex a factual extrapolation, meaning these favorable facts lead us to believe we can be hopeful. And so I would say to Syracuse uh, students, faculty, staff, this is the moment in which you choose to look at your history. One of the things I teach in my class is what I call uh, developing your own hermeneutic of history. You develop your own way of interpreting your history. So you look at your history of activism at Syracuse and say, what can we draw from this to empower us in the moment? What, do we, what lessons do we draw from this present experience? How have we created community? How have we, we maintain relationships among students, faculty, and staff in this moment? And you extrapolate from this experience to say, we have decided we will be hopeful. We have decided that we will go forward. We, we see this in history all the time. You know, look at Dr. You know, Dr. King in so many instances, so many chapters, could have, should have given up hope. Hmm. And so my, my point being here is we as a country, we as a university com community uh, are certainly uh, faced with a kind of existential choice. 
we can allow the circumstances to tell us what we should aspire to, or we can take these circumstances and extrapolate from them what we will aspire to. And that's everything. That is everything. And, and I guarantee you, years from now, historians will write about certain citizens who decided to take these circumstances in their own hands and make something of them. And those will be the people that um, we will note in history. Uh, others will be less noted. I want to bring together, I'm going to try to bring together a couple different questions here that I'm receiving. We've got a question from Ingrid. We've got one from Lori. One just came in from Jason. I'm going to try to synthesize these together. Is I mentioned before about some of the consequences of crisis, and one of them is coalition. Mm -hmm. uh, alliances of discontent, if you will. And I'm wondering, as we think about this moment and the energy that many are feeling at this moment, some for the first time, That's right. how, how do you see this momentum carrying forward? Or another way to ask this is, what are some of the unique coalitions that you see being formed with the potential to carry forward and to create systemic, sustainable change? Sure, sure. So um, we have an incredible amount of, of energy. Uh, it is extraordinarily broad, meaning uh, every region of the country, every racial, ethnic group, uh, and it's also intergenerational. So what, one of the things I would suggest here is that we have to build a narrative infrastructure, meaning we gotta tell stories. Right. Well, in other words, I, I teach in a policy school, right? So we can talk about uh, the empirical scope and sweep of police misconduct, uh, the, the fatalities, the, the racial differences. Uh, we can talk about qualified immunity. We can talk about various strategies for reforming the culture of policing. But we have to tell stories that allow us to have empathy uh, for one another. That, so that narrative infrastructure, creating the ability to share stories is key. Number two, building old fashioned infrastructure. Hmm. Meaning we need to have organizations that have the ability to keep people in touch with one another, to hold meetings. I wanna be very clear about this. Now I'm not saying this is a kind of anachronistic throwback. Um, after we tweet, after we meet on, you know, on Zoom, we have to be able to develop agendas and priorities. This is key because if you don't build the infrastructure, you don't hold the people together in a way that in, goes beyond the moment to ensure that you have a sustainable movement. So a narrative infrastructure, a real infrastructure. Last point here is um, uh, policy content. Well, excuse me, the penultimate point. Policy content, meaning you get, we have to know what we're talking about, right? So in other words, we have to know what do we seek in terms of policy, in terms of reform, in terms of transformation, in terms of laws passed, in terms of best practices, in terms of regulatory reform. You don't have to know all this yourself, but you gotta build a team to get the information. Last point here, which is really the first point, the most fundamental point, is a moral foundation. I have to be honest. Like I've, been, I've done this work 25 years, and here's what I found. If you're a leader trying to lead without character, it's dangerous, right? In other words, you got to live by your promises. Tell the truth. Don't steal from your people, right? Demonstrate integrity so that people respect you, so that you have credibility, so that when you lose, people know that you, lo you lost because you gave it your best, uh, but you're not giving up. So that character piece is critically important. Why? Because sometimes if you have a million Twitter followers, and 10 people, who, and you don't have 10 people who trust you, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. I think in this moment, having that, again, that uh, moral character foundation, a kind of narrative infrastructure, real infrastructure, and policy content. Those four things allow movements to produce real results uh, for real people. So in other words, if we tweet about the moment uh, and, and, and end up on MSNBC or CNN, but... 10 years from now, we have 100 more George Floyds is a problem. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to our doing what we can to address this moment.
in a way that builds a sustainable movement, in a way that alleviates uh, injustice and brings about justice. That inspires people and brings more people to the cause and makes the vision real. Uh I've asked you a lot of questions already. We've tried to take some questions from our viewers and I know that we never can cover all the topics that we want to cover. So I always feel uh, compelled to say here as we come to the end of our conversation, Reverend Brooks, some final thoughts for the Syracuse University community, uh, things that are on your heart, on your mind that you want to share that uh, I have not yet given you the opportunity to share. Well, first of all, uh, let me end, if you will, uh, with a note of gratitude. This is my second time visiting uh, Syracuse. I did so a few years ago as president and CEO of the NAACP, and it blesses me greatly um, to be the guest of your chaplain, to be a part of this conversation. Uh, second point here is I, I would simply say this. The point about hope cannot be uh, overstated. Um, you can develop a wonderful policy agenda. You can spend four years in, in, in college and graduate with a great GPA and great career prospects. But the one thing that will sustain you is a, a deep sense of hope. And the hope is not just in yourself with respect to your own life, but a hope with respect to those you went to school with, um, your classmates, this community that you call Syracuse. And so that's the thing that allows you to come together five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, talking about what we have achieved, what we have done, how far we have come. And so uh, with that, 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 that's the word um, that animates and inspires my life. And that's the word I would leave uh, with all of you. And uh, thank you and um, um, hold on to your hopes. No matter just want to thank Reverend Brooks for being with us tonight and to all who have tuned in. Thank you so much for this sixth installment of Matters That Matter from Hendricks Chapel. As always, we wish you health, we wish you hope, and we wish you the fullness of God's blessings this evening and always. Thanks, everybody. God bless you. Have a great night. Mm -hmm.